First of all, just thank you for joining us uh, for today's um, Meet the Mind session on the topic of moving towards health, helping the most at-risk patients in hospitals get moving. Uh, my name is Alan Sicklow. I'm from the Flinders University Meet the Minds team, and I'm really excited today to be here to explore the consequences of immobility and prolonged bed rest and the solutions for getting at-risk people moving again in hospital. Um, this event is delivered as part of the Meet the Minds lunchtime lecture series here at Flinders University, um, where you get to meet Flinders University's most engaging minds as they bring their latest research from a diverse range of backgrounds um, to, to the fore. Uh, today, we're really fortunate to be meeting uh, Dr. Claire Baldwin. She's a senior lecturer here um, at Flinders University in physiotherapy, and she's an early career researcher at the Caring Futures Institute. Claire's research is focused on helping the most at-risk people in hospital get moving and connecting research um, with her experience from a clinical practical setting um, in, in acute hospital settings. From a record of more than 20 research publications to date, uh, most recently she has led a world first and award winning consensus guideline project to support older adults to sit less and move more when in hospital for an acute medical illness. Now, um, as always, um, we're really keen to make this an interactive event. Um, we've got live Q&A. It's your chance to participate um, in a discussion and pose questions to Claire in real time. Um, however, I do ask that everyone please treat this forum as a place of respectful engagement, uh, where people are treated with dignity and where differing views um, are tolerated. Now, we'll start, we're ready to start receiving questions now via the messaging platform, so please feel free to do so. Um, and I, I hope um, we'll, the, the technical gremlins have, have, have gone away now and, and we'll be fine um, for me to hand over to Claire. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Claire Baldwin. Um, thank you, Claire. Over to you. All right. Thank you so much. And look, thank you to everyone who's listening online for choosing to engage with this presentation which Alan said, as I'm going to tell you about the issue of immobility and inactivity for people in hospital. And then I'll share how the research that I lead and collaborate on here at Flinders is seeking to address this long-standing problem. Plus, you'll learn a little bit about me along the way, so that by the end of the session, I hope that you will be inspired by our ambitious goal to support people to sit less and move more when in hospital for surgery or an illness and in turn, improve how they function physically, emotionally, and socially, plus reduce impacts on the hospital system. But before going any further, I also want to acknowledge the indigenous people of our country, and in particular, the Ghana people, the traditional owners of the lands and waters of the region on which I am located. So to understand the context and history of this issue, let me take you back in time some 70 years to when a paper was published in the British Medical Journal about the dangers and consequences of bed rest. The author identifies people being alone, at risk of complications such as blood clots, incontinence and pressure sores, experiencing significant muscle wastage and a deterioration in their mental health and well-being. The author advocates, teach us to live that we might dread unnecessary time in bed. If we get people up, we might save patients from an early grave. But even much earlier than that, 150 years ago, Florence Nightingale had written, keep no patient in hospital a day longer than is absolutely necessary. And even this may be days too long. The patient may have to, not, may have to recover not only from illness or injury, but from hospital itself. So it is long recognised that there can be unintended consequences and complications associated with hospitalisation, and this includes deconditioning. Now, deconditioning is the physical, psychological and functional decline that occurs as a result of prolonged bed rest, which is really an extreme form of immobility. But we also see significant de deconditioning with very low levels of physical activity, and with long bouts of being in a sedentary posture, like sitting or lying down. So basically what happens in hospital. Deconditioning is associated with a range of impacts, and here you can see that includes a loss of muscle mass, which is related to a loss of muscle strength. Now people start to lose muscle mass and strength rapidly when not moving, within 24 hours in hospital, and some patient groups, such as those in the intensive care unit, patients can lose up to 20% of their muscle mass in just one week. But whether you're in ICU or just a normal hospital ward, this muscle wasting and weakness seems to particularly affect your large muscle groups and those in your legs. So things like your quadriceps. 
And these are such important muscle groups for being able to stand up and actually have the opportunity to move more. There are changes in other body systems that include your bone density, which can increase the risk of fracture if you have a fall. And there are other changes in the cardiovascular, metabolic and respiratory systems, which in hospital increases that risk of blood clots, chest infections or problems with your skin integrity. And cognitive function is also related to your physical capabilities. So that when you haven't had enough movement or mobility, you're more likely to develop delirium. Now, deconditioning on its own and each of these complications that stem from it prolong length of stay, they require increased healthcare resources and therefore they elevate costs. Plus for the individual and their family, their quality of life can suffer greatly. Now, not everyone in hospital will experience notable deconditioning, but a large number will. We think this is as many as two in three people aged 65 or older. And it's in these older adults in whom the effects can be more severe, more rapid and sometimes irreversible. So why is it so? Well, most basically, the adage of use it or lose it broadly holds true. And this is such that when a decline in activity or function reaches a critical level, these impacts can be more marked and noticeable. So someone who was independent before their illness can lose that independence, especially if they're also frail. So in the graph here, if an older person who is frail experiences even a relatively minor illness, but it's enough to bring them to hospital, so something like a urinary tract infection, it has a bigger impact on the health status, which is the dip in red, that also takes longer to bounce back, and in some cases it doesn't reach previous levels, and it means someone may not be able to return home. And that was the experience of my nana towards the end of a thankfully, otherwise very healthy and active life, so deconditioning and the importance of safe mobility during hospitalisation is something that I've seen from that personal perspective, but also my clinical experience as a physiotherapist working in the acute hospital setting. Physios have particular expertise in exercise and movement therapy and rehabilitation. And it's from that that I've had the privilege to see both the successes and challenges that people face when they're in hospital for illness or following surgery. And this is as they try to recover physically alongside their medical care. But commonly it's someone's physical capabilities that determine whether and when they can actually return home or not. So that's part of the motivation for why the research that I'm involved with mostly focuses on what happens during hospitalisation. It's such an important and opportune time to intervene, but it is just one part of the picture. So to really help these most at risk patients in hospital get moving, we need to understand the issue holistically. What we know is that even if you are one of the one in two Australians who do meet the public health physical activity guidelines, you are still exposed to some degree of inactivity if you're admitted to hospital. More often what I see is the impact of inactivity being a modifiable risk factor for conditions such as diabetes, cancer, dementia, heart disease and stroke, contributing to a decline in function for someone even before they present to hospital. But then of course what happens in hospital matters too. Data from several studies has shown that people who are more mobile in hospital then spend more time up on their feet and active post-discharge as compared to those who are less mobile in hospital. So people who can maintain some degree of activity alongside their medical management of their illness or surgery have a faster and more complete recovery and return to normal life. Conversely, and this is particularly for older medical patients, people who experience a decline in their function during hospitalisation or acquire a new limitation in an activity of daily living, so that means a loss of independence, say in walking, eating or dressing, have been shown to have poorer outcomes even out to 12 months following a single episode in hospital. Now, our research is seeking to change this historical status quo and no longer accept that deconditioning in hospital is something that just happens, but it is a big challenge. Firstly, because of the scale of the problem, Australia's population is aging and the trends are that hospitalisations have been increasing at a rate beyond population growth for Australians aged 65 years or older. In Australia, there are around 4 million acute 
overnight hospitalizations each year and 50% of those are for people aged 65 or older. So that's 2 million Australians at risk of hospital associated deconditioning based on age alone, even before we consider other individual health factors. Once admitted to hospital, my own literature review work and backed up by others has estimated that adults spend somewhere between 87 and 100% of their time sitting or lying down when in hospital for surgery or an illness. Then when patients do get up on their feet, this is really only very infrequently and for very, very low amounts of activity. In another one of my studies, this time of ICU survivors, even at the end of their hospital stay and just before discharge, they were only spending 47 minutes on average upright on their feet within a full 24 hour day. And only seven of those minutes were actually stepping or walking at a very slow pace. Now there is a lot of research that still needs to be done to understand the best dose and type of activity for people to safely do when in hospital. But the early signals are that for older adults, a very modest target of 900 steps per day, or even just slow walking twice a day so that you get around 20 minutes of movement altogether is just enough to reduce your risk of functional decline, reduce your length of stay and also risk of readmission. So actually it's a very achievable gap to bridge, but it's a surprisingly hard one. And this is because inactivity during hospital has been described as a wicked problem, meaning it looks simple on the surface, but in reality it is complex and it's resistant to resolution. Now a group of overseas researchers have spent a lot of time thinking and trying to understand what are these factors that keep people unnecessarily sitting, lying or inactive in hospital and the following considerations have been identified. So there are operational processes and policies to consider. There are people factors. So what's the knowledge, attitude and beliefs of our patients, family members and staff about activity during illness? This can work both favourably and unfavourably, and we know that there are both perceived benefits, but also perceived risks. There are cultural factors, and here I don't just mean at the individual level and what encouragement is given to patients, but also at an organisational level. So what's the hospital's safety culture or the ward ethos, which is consistently reported as a barrier and negative influence on the activity of behaviour of patients in research literature? And then there's the hospital environment itself. Quite simply, are there actually enough walking aids or suitable chairs for people to use? Are there actually reasons for people to get out of bed, places to go? And is the required support available from appropriately trained staff? To create real change and address this problem, we need to consider all these factors and this policy and practice context together. So that's what's most exciting about our research here at Flinders. We're helping the most at-risk patients in hospital get moving by tackling the issue at a range of levels, from practice to policy. I could talk all day on this, but I do just want to tell you about three research programs that are being led here from the Caring Futures Institute. Firstly, there's a different team of my colleagues um, who are working to shift those stubborn factors that keep people unnecessarily sitting, lying or inactive. They're working through some of those local system, process, environmental and cultural challenges within individual hospital wards. They're doing use this using a program called Eat, Walk, Engage, which seeks to holistically ensure that patients get adequate nutrition, hydration and movement to both prevent that functional decline I talked about earlier and also prevent delirium. But even if we can reset this scene with a more supportive environment for activity, some patients will still require extra attention and a more personalised approach. So secondly, I'm really proud to be part of supervising a PhD candidate who's been working on an individualised intervention that combines nutrition and exercise for older adults in hospital who are frail. This intervention starts early during hospitalisation and continues with a series of home visits and phone support calls for the first three months post discharge. The intervention is designed to be empowering and uniquely applies the Flinders model of chronic condition self-management. But the most significant and ongoing piece of work I've been leading over the past few years has been to, de to develop some physical activity and sedentary behaviour guidelines for older adults in hospital. 
And I'm undertaking a guideline project. Well, firstly, because there are no existing guidelines anywhere in the world that have been developed using a systematic and robust process. We have guidelines from the World Health Organization about what you and I should do in our usual everyday lives to sit less and move more, but not what happens when we're in hospital. And then also when I consider that most of those factors that keep people unnecessarily sitting and inactive are not actually related to a specific illness, I'm led to think that by looking more broadly, that I could really benefit a large number of patient groups by developing some simple, unifying and consistent guidance. We know that recommendations and guidelines can powerfully shape the behaviour of individuals and healthcare teams. They can support consistency and efficiencies in how healthcare is delivered. They can help to close any gaps between what we know from research evidence and what actually happens in practice. And if well implemented, there is potential for widespread impacts. So where are we up to with this work? Well, the first stage was to prioritise what we were going to make guidelines about. I knew that there were a whole range of things that we could um, work on, but really wanted anything uh, formulated to be relevant and match the priorities of people who would actually be using them, so patients and clinicians. So we started off by surveying um, a series of 49 people from nine countries. This was a group of researchers, doctors, nurses and physios, people with experience in developing physical activity policies and older adults. Out of that consensus process, we drafted some recommendations to help people sit less and move more. And we got some guidance on what types of outcomes people thought would be important to measure if we did do some of those other intervention studies like the ones I've talked about. In the draft recommendations, we got some really rich information. We had up to 29 sort of opinion based statements, but broadly there were concepts um, covering that a person centred approach should be used to engage and enable older adults, that it's actually a shared responsibility of all members of uh, the healthcare team between patients and working with other caregivers that we have to do this in a way that is sensitive, um, is respectful and is culturally responsive, and that these act opportunities for activity and minimising sedentary behaviour need to be incorporated throughout daily care. We have to focus on function and independence with activities of daily living. The next stage is for us to move from this opinion-based guidance um, to more evidence-based guidance. So we're gonna draw on our earlier learnings and use a structured methodology called the GRADE approach. What we need to do for that is recruit an advisory panel, which we've done. The panel's first job has been to make decisions about um, an extensive literature review, which we've started. And then once that review is complete, there'll be a process of rating the quality of the evidence that will be fed back to the panel. The panel then uses a structured decision-making process and then uh, we formulate some guidelines that could be worded more strongly or modestly, either for or against particular approaches. So in conclusion, we know that physical activity, even in hospital care, gives a sense of freedom, confidence in recovery and enhances well-being. So with our approach from policy to practice to help these most at-risk patients in hospital get moving, that is the future that we hope to see realised through our research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That was, that was uh, a fascinating, fascinating insight, uh, really critical area of research with, with global application and um, it really got me thinking about my 83 year old uh, mum um, and uh, you know she hasn't spent much time in hospital to date which is which is great uh, but it's certainly good to know that this issue is being of immobility and de deconditioning is being addressed so thank, thank you very much from, from myself and from the general public really. Um, please, I, I encourage everyone, uh, if you've got some questions, uh, please do uh, use the chat functionality to set them through. Um, I guess just to get the uh, discussion started, uh, Claire, you know, you've described the issue of inactivity during hospital hospitalisation as, as a wicked problem, um, and there's no den denying that it's a complex issue. Um, what are some of the barriers that you're, and challenges you're facing um, as you bring about change um, in getting people moving in hospitals? So uh, most immediately for our work, um, there's another review and piece of research I've done. Um, we actually tried to scope interventions and see what's out there, what are people doing? Um, and we were really surprised by the lack of evidence on actually what are effective strategies that actually result in patients sitting less or moving more. They might have other benefits, but we really want to know what actually works to get people up and moving. 
And so there's a growing evidence base, um, but that's one challenge that we face is actually we need to do some more work around actually de designing um, innovative interventions. Another challenge is this doesn't just affect one patient group. So um, traditionally, a lot of research has been done in silos. So perhaps just considering patients who have a stroke or after a particular type of surgery or a joint replacement. But there's a commonality um, of issues. And so that's, I suppose, how we're thinking about it a little bit differently. But that also brings us some challenges in that we want to make stuff that's generalizable. So a lot of people can use it, but also we don't want to dilute the message so much that people think, oh, these guidelines don't apply to me. So that's a that's a tension that we're mm -hmm. working through in our in our project. Um, and really, I guess the challenge is if you don't measure something, you don't know this is going on. You haven't got any benchmarks for, for being able to improve it. So they're some of the challenges that I think we face when I think um, hospitals and our partners would face as well. And and thinking of the, what what impacts is there any data on the impact that mobility has on um, recovery after leaving hospital? Yes, yeah, so actually this is another area where there's even more of a gap is we're great at sort of we're comparatively better at working out what happens in hospital, but there's not a lot of studies that do that long term follow up. So even in our review work, we've found that studies will capture what happens in hospital, but not that many were following patients up down the track. Um, it's certainly an area of interest for us. So you can see that's why we're looking at interventions that extend from hospital to home um, and trying to trying to measure that. So there is that little bit of data that looks at um, activity and um, risk of readmission, but obviously readmission is just one thing. Actually, you know, how many times do you then go visit your GP or access rehabilitation services? There's a whole range of other things that are important outcomes and actually important to patients to to, to patients as well um, that perhaps we're not capturing and it would be really great to. And I assume that um, there's increased risk with mobility, obviously amongst um, you know vulnerable patients. How do you manage that? Yeah, so um, so my background is you know, as a physio, so this is the bread and butter work I do in the hospital and most of my experience and actually my PhD started looking at muscle function in the intensive care unit. So that's most of where I've worked. And so if I can get those patients up and moving who are the sickest of the sick in hospitals safely, mm -hmm. then I think there's there's a lot that can be done. Of course, there are some barriers to limitations and it's really important that we don't um, that we don't ignore those. But when we look across um, safety data, Definitely having good communication, um, skilled teams really help that happen safely. That's the skill of your clinicians. Mm -hmm. And also I've had the pleasure of being involved with um, some work to, de to develop some safety guidelines for patients in ICU to get moving, um, led by some interstate colleagues. So I guess by providing that guidance and prompting teams around, this is what we actually think is OK, this is what we think you need to tread with caution about, um, you know, ha has been really helpful. Mm. So there is guidance um, available there. So I think it's about having a robust discussion and actually discussing those risks and benefits, because sometimes, um, yeah, the benefits will outweigh the risks and Absolutely. Just go for it. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. And, and I guess one of the other challenges, um, obviously uh, working in a hospital environment, there's a multi multidisciplinary um, teams. Um, how do you go about working within that multidisciplinary environment, um, not just with the physio, but with other healthcare professionals? And, and what sort of impacts are there on other healthcare professionals? Yeah. Um, that was a theme that came out really strongly from our survey consensus process was that this is everyone's responsibility. Of course, when you make mobility in hospital, everyone's responsibility, no one then owns it because you do need an element of leadership in there as well. Um, I guess we've approached this by always having multidisciplinary people involved in our research. So even now at this most recent stage of the guideline project, but also our earlier work, we've had doctors on the panel, we've had nurses there, we've had other consumers. And so we think that um, getting a breadth of opinions and people on board has been really key, really key to our success. But I know that on the ground, a lot of what clinicians want actually is some role clarity. So it's not just enough for some for someone to think, oh, it's the physio's job. Like it is our job to get people moving. But we also know that just being seeing a physio briefly for once a day is is not going to be enough. Part of the issue is not just getting people up, but it's doing it and breaking up your day so you get little bursts of, of activity. So that's where that's everyone's responsibility, just as it's our responsibility to help other parts of care. So to help patients to be independent with their toileting and showering, to make sure that when we're with patients, we support patients to have a drink, to take something to eat. So we actually all help each other. So it's um, 
so it's got to work in um yeah a very complex ecosystem but together i think that's um i think that's yeah the strength of how we're approaching it great well, it sounds like a, a good way forward and, and i'm thinking t today you know watching this um you know there's definitely going to be people that are considering potentially a research career in physiotherapy health and movement and i wondered um you know thinking about your own experience what, what would you say to them what would be your advice well, I'm biased, but of course I'd say go for it. I did it and I did my PhD here at Flinders and I thought it was fantastic. Um, but in all seriousness, I think there's so much work to be done, whatever your field of interest. Um, and you can really go from that very scientific kind of bench work to the bedside and then this translation. And even though my career has been relatively short, that's what I've done. I got to learn some lab skills when I did my PhD, um, you know, analyzing blood tests you know that's not what a physio normally does but I got to do that I did muscle measurements I've done this work at the bedside now I'm doing some work looking at I suppose that bigger picture and evidence into practice so look there's a whole range of things a whole range of approaches um, there's so much work to be done so it's it's such a great experience it really uh, a higher degree always challenges your thinking and really pushes you to think and learn in a different way to perhaps mm -hmm. what your normal discipline training is. That's what it was for me anyway. So, um, yeah, so I'm sure we'd love to hear from you at Flinders. <laughs> <laughs> You're very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Um, well, look, it, it's been a really wonderful and insightful discussion um, we've had today. I, I really appreciate you sharing and um, giving us your time, Claire, and, and sharing your knowledge. Um, it's, it's been really wonderful. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our audience today for their questions and, and interest in the event. Um, remember, uh, you can watch this session again on the Flinders YouTube channel um, or the Flinders U um, University Meet the Minds webpage. Um, just uh, look online um, or Google it. Uh, and you can also receive future uh, notifications of our future events. Um, and uh, our next Meet the Minds lecture is actually on a, on a topic close to my heart. It's on um, uh, the dad dilemma, navigating the complexities of contemporary fathering. And that's with Dr. Sarah Hunter on the 12th of October at 12.30 p.m. So please be on the lookout for that and register if, um, if it's uh, the topics of interest to you. Um, for now, um, thank you everybody once again. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you again soon.